Okay, this morning I'm going to talk about graph sets. Uh, this is a concept that we've been using in our lab for a while, and the form of the talk will be I'm going to give you some background on why we originally thought about them at all in the first place. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do it, how to apply graph sets to structures, and then at the end I'll talk about some applications. And I encourage those of you in the audience who have questions as we go, go on along to ask them if you like or to ask questions at the end. If you ask a question, what I'll do is repeat it so that it gets onto the um, tape clearly. The talk today was one that I first prepared to give in Cambridge, England, and I was there oh, about a year and a half ago now and uh, talked to the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center about this work. And interestingly, they're going to be working with one of my collaborators, Professor, Professor Joel Bernstein, this summer um, to try and program graph sets so that they can search crystal structures and search for graph sets in the structures. And I think you'll see why as we go along that that's really necessary. All right, I'm going to start off, first of all, talking about representations that we as organic chemists use daily and why we use them. These are representations of molecules. And we have different ways for showing um, int intramolecular interactions, for talking about them, for drawing pictures. These little pictures I've drawn of chlorobenzene are just representations of chlorobenzene. The question to think about for a moment is why are these appropriate representations? Why is it we use them and it's useful to us as chemists? Part of it is because what we're showing with these representations are the connectivity patterns of the atoms. We're not talking about bond lengths and angles here. We're not talking about the size of the molecule. We're not talking about its symmetry properties. But each one of these representations shows us something about connectivity. And the, the connectivity of atoms is what makes the molecule, right? The other thing that's important here, though, is that it, it shows relationships that can be measured. And as chemists, we're going to work on things that are measurable. If it's completely impossible to measure, measure something, we're going to work on another problem. So these representations are chemically and spectroscopically convenient for us as chemists. And what do I mean by convenience? Well, a definition is suitability for performing an action or for fulfilling a requirement. So what is the requirement that chemists have? The requirement has been to understand the structure of a molecule in solution or in the gas phase. And that's why those representations are useful. They're single molecules, they show connectivity, and they show something useful. Tools to study the reactivity and structure of molecules in the solid state were not even available to organic chemists during the heyday of organic chemistry, 1850 to 1950, when all of the principles were being defined and organic chemistry was just taken off like a shot. We didn't have the tools to ask about intermolecular interactions. And there was so much work to be done looking at intramolecular interactions that solid state chemistry got kind of ignored. So that the things that we needed to study intermolecular interactions, it wasn't convenient. These things weren't measurable. And so basically, we ignored the questions of intermolecular interactions. In about 1970, crystallography became important to organic chemists. That's because the technique had developed far enough, well, or had developed significantly enough at that time that it became easy to get structures of organic compounds. Before that, crystallography was primarily used for inorganic compounds, um, and organic chemists hadn't yet tied into the concept that crystallography might be useful to them. But in the 1970s, organic chemists started to use crystallography mainly as a support tool for helping them to do characterizations of molecules um, in solution. So you're going to do a crystal structure. You're going to look at the individual molecule and ask, has it taught me something in addition to what I learned from my NMR studies or from my infrared studies in solution? 
But with all the crystal structures that were done in the 70s and in the 80s, very rarely did anyone ask, what has it taught me about intermolecular interactions? So all this data is being collected. It's now convenient, it's now measurable, it's now useful, but very few people are tuned in to even thinking about intermolecular interactions. But this data is being collected and being amassed. So it's there, it's ready for us to use. And the time that we started really using this data was in about 1990. And that's when the term molecular recognition became popular. And in, a, in, in essence, organic and biochemists discovered the idea of molecular recognition, started talking about it, working in the area. And molecular recognition means that we're going to now have to emphasize intermolecular interactions. It's now become OK for organic chemists to talk about them. And so now all of a sudden, we're going to start looking for ways to measure them. So the solid state, study of the solid state, study of organic crystals is becoming accepted as relevant to organic chemistry. And that means that intermolecular interactions will be studied and we have ways to conveniently study them. The problem that I saw and a lot of other people saw is that there wasn't any suitable protocol for representing these intermolecular interactions. We didn't have these nice little pictures that organic chemists have for drawing molecules and showing connectivities of atoms. We didn't have easy ways to talk about connectivities of molecules. And so it has made it extremely difficult to compare crystal structures and to compare solid state materials, partly because we don't have representations for the very things that we're measuring. Now, we actually do have some representations for intermolecular interactions, but what I'll show you is that these are not uh, useful for studying how molecules interact with one another chemically. Most of these representations were developed from crystallographic studies. One kind of intermolecular representation of an intermolecular interaction is a picture like this, where we represent the molecules and their symmetry in a unit cell. That is a representation of intermolecular interactions. Another kind of representation is to give a space group. It tells something about the interactions between molecules. It gives you some boundaries for what's happening, but it still doesn't give much chemical information about how one molecule is interacting with another. We have symmetry relations that can be represented this way. That gives us a little bit more, more information. But still, if you're an organic chemist, you want to know what that carbonyl group was doing. And this doesn't tell you that. We can draw ORTEP pictures. That We get this information from crystal structures. This is getting a little closer. You look at an ORTEP picture, and you see how the atoms are oriented one to another. But if you're comparing 50,000 crystal structures, you have 50,000 ORTEPs, and believe me, often one ORTEP is a challenge, let alone comparing 50,000. Now, another way that, that is even more useful is to draw out the atoms and show the connectivity interaction that you're interested in. It might be a hydrogen bond, although it might be charge transfer interaction, it might be a particular Van der Waals contact that you're interested in. It could be any kind of intermolecular interaction that you care about. And I'm mostly going to talk about hydrogen bonds today, but the idea of graph sets is not limited to hydrogen bonding. It's a more general concept. So now this is kind of nice. This focuses on the intermolecular interaction that we care about, that we want to measure, that we think is important to the properties of the material. But again, are you going to compare 70,000 structures and you've got to draw these all out? And where do you get that information from? Well, you get it from the crystal structure, from the ORTEP, from the symmetry. This is a difficult, this is a difficult problem. And it'll give you some information, but you're still going to be stuck. Um, you're going to be stuck with the problem that you don't know how to talk about what you have. You have it in front of you, but you can't work with it conveniently. And it isn't even a spectroscopic or chemical problem. It's a communication problem, basically. So as an organic chemist interested in molecular recognition, what we'd like to know about and here, here's the concept that I think is probably the most important of everything I'm going to talk about today, is what I think is important are the connectivity patterns. That's like what's important with chlorobenzene. It's the connectivity of atoms. I'm going to talk about connectivity of molecules. 
I'm not going to talk about how close they are. I'm not going to talk about how big they are or their symmetry relations. I want to just say what's connected to what. And if I can do that in a convenient way, I can start talking about solid state chemistry. So we have something like a ring, a carboxylic acid. Dimers form rings, so it's something I might, I might use is just plain old ring. And I could go through the literature and say, how often do we find hydrogen bonded rings? That's a starting point. Or I might ask, do I have hydrogen bonded chains? And for carboxylic acids, the difference simply between a chain and a ring is enormous in terms of their physical properties. Their IR spectra are different. So ring and chain is a, is a good starting point. And this is, the, this is the idea. This isn't quite specific enough to cover all chemistry, but this is the idea. So let's look at an example here. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Linda Sweeting, she's at Towson State in Maryland, has looked at, uh, done the crystal structures of three anthracene carbonyls. And the difference here is each one of them has an OH group. But as we go across the series, she has no methyl groups, one methyl group, and then two methyl groups. And what she asked was, how are the connectivity patterns different for these three samples? And in one case, she found a ch hydrogen bonded chain. In another case, she found a hydrogen bonded helix. And in the other one, she found a finite hydrogen bond pattern that contained four of these OH groups. These patterns are what's going to make the solid state chemistry of one, of one different from the other. It's going to make their optical properties, their thermal properties, their physical properties, their fracture planes, all of that's going to be related to this kind of connectivity pattern. The other thing that might be important here is that it might be that this kind of aggregation pattern is what happens in solution immediately prior to crystal nucleation. And so maybe from the solid state we can learn something about how molecules are associating in solution even though the concentration of that species might be so low you couldn't possibly measure it. But these are real real differences, they're very interesting and we'd like to be able to talk about them and catalog them and compare them with other structures. And I'd like to be able to do it without having to draw the picture every time I want to talk about it. And just to show you an example, this is a structure from our lab that Susan Reitzel did. Here's a succinimid and we make a co-crystal with hydroquinone and here's the pattern. Well, you can look at that for a long, long time. There are a lot of interesting things there. These are very simple molecules. You see some rings. You see some chains. But here's another chain. And there's another chain. How can we say what's happening here without drawing a picture and pointing to it? And then how could we compare this with another structure that might have anthracene and um, thiocyanine dyes in it? where the molecules are entirely different, but it could have the same, uh, same or subsets, similar subsets of hydrogen bond patterns. And it's those similarities that we'd like to be able to capture because they're going to show up spectroscopically and crystallographically and eventually, as a solid state synthetic chemist, I'd like to design these things. So it would sure help if I could identify them and talk about them. All right, so we're going to look at this question as a topological problem. And, and we need to think a bit about what I mean by that. It's basically that we're going to talk about connectivities, like with chlorobenzene. What we're not going to do is to invoke symmetry relations, bond lengths and angles, unit cell size or space group, size of the molecule, distances between molecules. And if you're a crystallographer, it is going to be very hard for you to not do these things because that's how crystallographers define the solid state. And what I'm saying is that we have to train ourselves to forget these things for a while so that we can look at the chemical relationships between the molecules and not these other properties. We want to do both. But in order to do the topological problem, you've got to forget these things or you'll get all confused. There is some precedent for this perspective. Wells, who's written this wonderful textbook on structural inorganic chemistry, 
has um, a, no a notation which is very simple where I think it's one of the first attempts to try and define hydrogen bond patterns. And he just has two qualifiers. One of them is the number of hydrogen bonds per molecule. And the other one is the number of molecules bonding to any other molecule. So you have a molecule and you ask how many hydrogen bonds are coming to it. That's small n. And then you say, how many molecules are connected to it? Because one molecule might have one or two or three hydrogen bonds. And so those two descriptors, that's a pretty good start. That's a pretty good start on defining what's happening to my molecule in the solid state. Hamilton and Ibers took this one step further. And they were the first people to recognize that this kind of approach is similar to graph sets. Okay. I think before that it wasn't, it wasn't important. I mean, you just had two qualifiers. But they said, you know, this is sort of like graph set theory. And graph set theory is a whole branch of mathematics. There are lots of people who've spent decades thinking about graph sets and topology, but not in relation to molecules and crystal structures. Now, what they're going to do are use two other qualifiers, which are basically the same. And their qualifiers, this is how their qualifiers relate to the ones I just showed you for wells. But their main contribution was to say, you know what we're doing? We're thinking of molecules as if they were points and hydrogen bonds as if they're lines. That's what the topology means. That was their contribution, is to say, you know, that's what this, this reduces your structure to points and lines. And so then the problem is, if you have a fishnet of points, which are molecules, and lines, which are hydrogen bonds, the problem then is how do you describe that fishnet? Okay, and then they also introduced the idea of the degree of a pattern, which is the number of lines you have per point. And we're going to use the degree idea a little bit later. So our challenge then is describing the topology of these networks, whether it involves molecules or fishnets or crochet patterns. Now, Kuleshova and Zorki took this idea one step further, and they actually introduce graph set notation, which looks like what the mathematicians use. And we're going to use something very similar to this for our graph set analysis. So the capital G, I'll show you in a minute, there are several uh, types, basic types of graphs, which will be identified by a capital letter. The superscript N in their notation are the number of bonds that you, number of intermolecular bonds you have to break in order to release that molecule from the structure. How many hydrogen bonds do you have to break before you can pull that molecule out? The small subscript M in their notation are the number of molecules to which every point on the graph is connected. So it's a similar idea to what we've been talking about. K is, are the dimensions of rings. So if there are any rings in there, what they want to say is how big or small the rings are. It turns out, for some reason, chemists really focus on rings. And when you look at crystal structures and hydrogen bond patterns, we just, our pattern recognition capabilities, the physiology of our brain, for some reason, makes us pick rings out. So rings are very important. And perhaps they also recognize that. And they want to pick out the rings they pick out. They're going to tell you how big they are. And I'll pull this up just for a minute to show you the reference uh, to their work, which is, uh, was in Octocrist in 1980. Now, the kinds of the four major types of graph sets they have, I'm going to show here. The first one are infinite sets. This is where molecules are bonded together, uh, finite, I'm sorry, finite. Where molecules are bonded together in a finite pattern, it doesn't extend forever and ever. Like you have two things bonded together, so you have a dimer. Or you have a small ring. And these are like little islands, so they call that capital I. Another possible mode of bonding is in a chain, and that's infinite, or in layers, or in three-dimensional frameworks. And so those are the four letters that they will use in place of that capital G in their notation. And so if they pull out the crystal structure of tartaric acid, 
to look at it, it really looks complicated. There are lots of hydroxyl groups there. But they can reduce it to this representation. Mesotartaric acid has a layer pattern. That means that the hydrogen bonds connect molecules into layers, not into three-dimensional networks. They have four molecules connected to each point. Right? Four molecules connected, but they have eight hydrogen bonds to each point. And the size of the hydrogen bonded rings in the structure, there are rings that have size 2, that's this ring right here, and then rings of size 8, uh, 4, 4 molecules in a ring. 2 molecules in a ring and 4 molecules in a ring. And you can go on and look at bigger and bigger and bigger rings in the structure, but this is the minimum definition needed, and that's tartaric acid. And so now you could compare this with the resolved tartaric acids or with other acids or even with other crystal structures that, that aren't organic acids at all. But it's a nice tool. Now, what I've talked about up till now are historical precedents for our work. And all of them have their origins in mineralogy and in organic chemistry. So they were attempting to categorize very complex 3D coordination patterns. The inorganic chemists were looking at topology long before the organic chemists were because they had such complicated three-dimensional patterns. So they were forced to try and find ways to define them long before uh, it seemed to be a problem to us. But I'm interested in molecular recognition. And so what is my purpose? I would like to know about relationships between functional groups on molecules. I want to know what functional groups recognize others and attract one to another. And I want to know about the connectivity patterns that result from having those functional groups recognize one another and, and be attracted to one another and form those intermolecular bonds. So I have a little bit different purpose than the mineralogists did. So what I'm going to do is to come up with a compromise between the rigor of graph theory, which the predecessors here applied rigorously so that the mathematicians would be very happy with how they used their graph theory. They used absolutely the rigorous definitions and it worked. It worked for what they were interested in. But what they lost was the information about molecules and functional groups. And I'd like to reintroduce that. And I found to reintroduce it, to talk about molecules and bonds, rather than points and lines, that I'm going to have to sacrifice a little bit of the rigor of this theory. What I want to do is to differentiate between different kinds of molecules, different kinds of functional groups, and different kinds of bond, intermolecular bonds. And if you think back to that picture of tartaric acid, every line was identical, even though each one of those hydrogen bond types was not identical. So that information was lost. Even though you had a nice, tidy pattern, a lot of chemical information was lost there. In effect, the points and the lines need qualifiers. And once that idea is there, there may be many ways to do it. But we've picked, we've picked a way to do it. And I'm not necessarily sure it's the best way, but at least it's a way, and it's a start. So what I... What I, I'm going to try and do now is to abstract hydrogen bond patterns out of crystal structures and give them representations we can work with. And I'm going to use graph sets as my idea for these representations. And I'm going to remind you that this is an abstraction. You've got to forget bond lengths, angles, symmetry elements, unit cell, atom types, and intramolecular connectivities. So we're going to forget that you have carbon atoms in a row or nitrogens. And we're going to forget about the symmetry elements of the crystal structure. And this is really a challenge. But that's what topology is all about. So if we're going to throw all that out, what are we going to keep? We're going to keep anything? Well, we're going to retain the number of different kinds of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. This is how I'm qualifying those points. A point wasn't quite enough information for me. So I'm going to introduce some way to talk about hydrogen bond donor and acceptor groups that are on your molecule. I'm also going to differentiate between a donor and acceptor. A donor is, is giving a uh, connecting unit out. An acceptor is accepting it in. And I'm going to differentiate between those two. Crystal structure is going to be represented not by one graph set. The predecessors had a way to come up with a single graph set that represented the entire crystal structure. 
I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. What I'm going to do is assign graph sets to subsets of the crystal structure, and then we're going to put these graph sets together, and the, the individual pieces will add up to the whole. But one of the reasons this is interesting is that sometimes those individual pieces are much more important chemically than the whole. And often we won't even bother with the whole. We'll just bother with pieces. And we're going to have labels for the most useful connectivity patterns. And I'll show you what those are. We have to introduce some assumptions in order to make our method work. And hopefully what I'd like to do is to have a method where when I sign a graph set and Tori signs a graph set, we get the same thing. So there are going to be some assumptions we have to agree on. Those assumptions aren't written in stone. Someone else could devise a graph set method based on these principles and make different assumptions and make it work. So I'm not sure the best assumptions, but we have to make some. Hopefully these assumptions will be chemically reasonable. I know that they're not going to be rigorously logical in terms of the mathematical use of graph sets. The method that we have come up with is the most useful for structures that have low densities of hydrogen bonds. Structures like ice and glycine and squaric acid and small molecules that have hydrogen bonds all over the place or inorganic structures that have ions and hydrogen bonds all over the place, our method's not very good for. Our method is really designed for structures that are typical of organic compounds, where you've got a lot of organic stuff and then you have some patterns associated with it. And if your organic compound has enormously complex hydrogen bond patterns, at some point you want to ask yourself, do I want to assign a graph set to part of this structure? Or do I want to go back and use Kuleshova and Zorki's method and assign those graph sets which has le have less chemical information in them but do give you a nice representation? And so when you get to the more complicated uh, systems where you have all sorts of intertwining hydrogen bond patterns, you have a choice to make. Frequently, we're going to assign only part of a total crystal structure. We're going to analyze only part of it and only some of many possible graph sets. And it's just amazing how assigning just a small number of the graphs that are present in a crystal structure can give you enormously useful chemical information. Okay, now I'm referencing here the handout that some of you have in front of you, where we have, we have said what our assumptions are and how we're going to do use our method. I would like to emphasize again, the way that this method is applied is not fixed in stone. It is one way to do it, and there might be other ways. And I think that especially as we go to, to program these methods, we're going to want to change some of these assumptions, because eventually I would like to make this really useful um, and compatible with a computer program that can do a lot of the searching for us. But what we're going to start with is, first of all, the molecules that we want to analyze is call, are going to be called an array. It may or may not be in a crystal structure. That's not necessary. It might be just something you draw. It might be a surface pattern that you're interested in or that, where you're suggesting a structure. So this is the whole set of molecules you're interested in. The network is a subset of that array, and it's the subset where all the molecules in a network are hydrogen bonded to one another. Okay, so there are going to be several subsets within an array. And a network means you have hydrogen bond connections between all those molecules, so they're talking to each other. A motif is a subset of that network. And what a motif is are molecules that are hydrogen bonded together by the same kind of hydrogen bond. Let's say you have five kinds of hydrogen bonds in your structure. Pick one of them and forget about all the other hydrogen bonds and make only that one kind of hydrogen bond, but make it everywhere that it occurs. The molecules that are connected by that process are a motif. And then the representation we're going to use looks like this. I'm going to have a descriptor like Kuleshov and Zorki did, but I'm also going to have four of them, but the descriptors they have had are not really uh, particularly useful for us. So I'll, I'll show you we have different descriptors there. For us, these superscripts and subscripts are going to be the number of different donor and acceptor sites used in a pattern, not the number per molecule. And this is an assumption. You could have done it one way or you could have done it the other, but we're going to choose that these are the number of acceptors and donors in a pattern 
and hopefully apply that definition consistently. And then in parentheses we have the degree of a pattern. And if you're talking about rings, that'll be the size of a ring. But if you're talking about other kinds of patterns, the degree will be defined some other way, but basically it's talking about the size, how big that pattern is. And the four descriptors we're going to use are if you have an intramolecular hydrogen bond, and this is strictly, if you use the kuleshovan zorki method, remember their molecule was just a dot. There's no way even to imagine an intramolecular hydrogen bond there. But these happen, and they're very important in organic chemistry, so we want to identify them. So if there's an intramolecular hydrogen bond, we're going to call that an S pattern. If our molecules are bonded into infinite chains, we'll call them C. That's the same qualifier we had before. If the, the pattern we're looking at, the motif, bonds molecules into a ring, rings are finite, and we'll just call that R. And then we can also have non-cyclic finite patterns, where you just bring two or three things together and they bond to each other. And they don't go in a ring and they don't continue on and on in a chain. And so we're going to call these D for dimers, but you can have more than two molecules in a D pattern. But this is just a way to remember what D means. And so let's look at benzoic acid, which forms a cyclic dimer pattern. We have two proton donors in the pattern, and we have two acceptors in the pattern. So A and D are two. If we had a chain of alcohols, we don't want to talk about the number of donors and acceptors in the entire motif because it's infinite. So for a chain, we talk about the number of donors and acceptors per repeat unit. And that's one donor and one acceptor per repeat unit. These are the assumptions I'm telling you that are, they're not chemically mandatory. They're just assumptions we need to make this work and someone else might make different assumptions. It might, there might be a better way to do this. All right, the degree, or the degree is going to be the number of atoms in a ring or the number of atoms in a repeat unit. And here's an important idea that, that we thought was useful. That is that we're going to count the number of atoms in the ring traversing covalent and hydrogen bonding bonds. So the ring for us will contain eight atoms. We're going to go right across those double bonds, single bonds, hydrogen bonds as if this is topological. The atoms are all there. It doesn't matter what's holding them together. The topology of the ring can be defined. All right, now we have those assumptions. Now let's assign a graph set. And the first thing we're going to do is look at motifs. And remember, motifs are sets of molecules that are connected by repeating one kind of hydrogen bond over and over. And if there are other kinds of hydrogen bonds present, you forget them. You scratch them out, you pretend they're not there. So you want to first identify the different types of hydrogen bonds that you have in your structure. And if you had an amide, this hydrogen bond is different than this hydrogen bond those hydrogens are different. This bond is closer to that oxygen, this bond is closer to that phenyl ring. So those are two different types of hydrogen bonds. In order, again, to, to be consistent, it would be nice if we could rank the hydrogen bonds. So I, so I could call this hydrogen bond type one and hydrogen bond type two. Um, and we have proposed some chemical priority rules. They're based on the Kahn and Gold Prelog chemical priorities. But their rules don't cover all hydrogen bond cases, so we've added a few more. So to be completely consistent, so that you and I assign the same graph set, we should have the same priorities, so we know to start at the same point. In practice, we never do this. OK, we just pick out the motifs and assign the motifs. But I think when, a, when the program starts doing it, the program is going to want to systematically decide which one of those to choose. This is a pain in the neck. So we just don't do it most of the time. <laughs> OK. So ha now we're going to pick one of those hydrogen bonds, whichever one you want. Find all occurrences of it throughout the array of molecules you're interested in and completely forget the others. Then imagine that each one of these hydrogen bonds is gluing one molecule to the other. So you can reach in to your array and pull out one molecule. Pull that molecule out and everything that comes with it. And that's your motif. 
and look at what comes with it. Have you pulled out a ring? Have you pulled out a chain? Have you pulled out something infinite or something finite? And what you pull out with this glue test gives you the type of graph you have. And then, having done that, you have your graph set. You can assign a graph set. You look at what you pulled out and then assign your graph set. So here's a chain. There's, so that's capital C. There's one donor and one acceptor per repeat unit. And the size of the chain, the size of the repeat unit, is seven atoms. So this is the graph set. And you could now go and design all sorts of molecules that would have that graph set and have no chemical relationship at all to this molecule. The graph set is a topology that is not defined by the type of atom or by the type of electronic system or any of those things, or the symmetry or anything. Then you repeat that process for all the different types of hydrogens, hydrogen bonds in your structure. And for, for people who will be listening to this tape who actually want to do this, I would like to point out that one of the, a, a very tricky point which has, we have been caught on many times, is we're talking about different kinds of hydrogen bonds, not different kinds of hydrogens. Because one hydrogen can enter into two or three or four different hydrogen bonds. So the motif idea and the graph set idea is based on a type of hydrogen bond, not a type of hydrogen. Okay. All right. Now this gets a little detailed. I'm just going to mention it. Having found the motifs that have a single kind of hydrogen bond repeated within them, you now can go back and look at your structure and say, I'm going to pick out other sets of molecules that have hydrogen bond type 1 and 2 in them. And so we're going to walk through the structure and we're going to traverse hydrogen bond type 1, walk through the molecule and go to hydrogen bond type 2, and walk through the molecule and go back to 1 and 2, etc., and then pull that set out. And we call that a higher order network, where we're now starting to mix different hydrogen bond types. And then if you have three, four, five, six types of hydrogen bonds, you can do all sorts of combinations here. But you can explicitly define what those patterns are. And you can do it systematically. And you can start mixing three types and four types. You can mix hydrogen bond type 1, 2, and 3. Or you can mix 1, 3, and 5 and ask what the patterns are that you get out. So the, the key with higher order networks is that there's more than one type of hydrogen bond in that pattern. Now let me show you a simple example. This is benzamide. The first order network is where we assign the motifs. The motifs are assigned according to the different types of hydrogen bonds present. And in this structure, we have a green hydrogen bond and a red hydrogen bond. All right, so let's look first at the red hydrogen bonds. They're the ones that are connected by H1. And so if we, if we start at this hydrogen bond, go through the molecule, find another one of those, and back to the starting point, then the red motif is a ring with two donors and two acceptors, and it's an eight-membered ring. It's just the same as the carboxylic acid dimer ring. Now we go to the other hydrogen bond type that the structure has. Here we start with hydrogen bond 2, and we go through the molecule and back to the next hydrogen bond 2. And you find you've got a chain. So, so you break all the red bonds, form only the green ones, and if you pull a molecule out, you have a chain. So this chain has one donor and one acceptor, which I don't always put in. That's just a default. And the length of the chain, the length of the repeat unit, is four atoms. So that now defines the first order network. It defines the motifs. And often, that's all you need to do if you're comparing different solid state materials. Often the differences show up right there, and they're important, and they're useful. But what if we want to look at the next higher order pattern where we combine red and green hydrogen bonds? Well, there's a pattern right here. Here we go from hydrogen bond type 1 to 2 through some covalent bonds, back to one, back to two, and through some covalent bonds. So there's a pattern that we're interested in. And I've redrawn it here. And we use the same uh, methodology for assigning the graph set to that pattern. It turns out to be a ring. There are four hydrogen bond donors and two acceptors in the ring, and it has an eight-membered ring. Interestingly, this particular pattern 
is almost as common as the carboxylic acid dimer and no one has ever noticed it before. And we didn't notice it either until we'd started assigning graph sets. And I'll show you another example in a minute. This occurs for many coke crystals. It occurs in peptides and amino acids. It occurs in all kinds of systems. Whenever you have an amine, a primary amine or amide, and a carbonyl of some kind, or a phosphoryl or a sulfuryl, you see this pattern all the time. It's one of the most common organizing patterns of organic molecules. And nobody knows it but us. Now, I'm going to show you one of our favorite molecules is PNA. And I'll show you a way we look at the motifs in PNA. I'll show you, see I'm talking about motifs, so I want to find hydrogen bonds that are the same and how they connect molecules together. And one reason I'm going to show you this is, let's just look at this particular pattern here first. This is a chain. It has a degree of eight. And that's a very simple concept to see here. Uh, it's very straightforward to assign that motif pattern. The green one, however, is a problem. And to date, we have not among ourselves yet decided how to assign this pattern. And we, come, we have come up with lots of problems like this. As we assign more and more graph sets, there are things that we hadn't thought of before. And it's logical extensions of applying this. I think as we go to program the graph set method, we're going to work these things out. But we hadn't anticipated all the problems. And one of the problems here is that hydrogen is bonded to a nitro group. And do you include this ring in the motif or don't you? Strictly speaking, if you're talking about hydrogen bond types, these are two different types. And the reason they're different is because this one has a second hydrogen bonded to it. So, so this should be another chain, and I should have left that oxygen out. But there are still some arguments that would say it ought to be done this way. And I don't need to go into, I'm not going to go into it now, it would just confuse you. But I wanted to show you that there are problems with applying this method. One of the reasons they're problems is that it isn't rigorous. And we had to make assumptions. And we want to find a method that's going to be useful. We don't want to have to have exceptions for every structure. That's not going to be very useful. So this has been a continuing problem for us. You can see it's getting to be a fairly complex network. So this is a pretty high density pattern. But I'd like to be able to assign graph sets to paranitroaniline. And if we can't assign them to paranitroaniline, then I'm not sure it's worth the trouble. It's very important to be able to assign at least this complex of a pattern. These are the higher order networks. We're starting to pick some of them out. Let's just look at the blue one. I've found a chain that has two hydrogens, and it picks up an oxygen. And so there's a chain of degree four, two donors and one acceptor. It may be that that kind of chain arrangement is important to the properties of this molecule. And maybe when we go to design related structures, what we want is to design molecules where we can have that chain in. Maybe that ring isn't important, but that chain is. At least we can start looking for the correlations once we've defined them and can talk about them. Okay, so I'd like to show you a couple of applications. That is why this approach or one like it might be useful. One of the things we can do is to compare hydrogen bond patterns in polymorphs. So that I showed you the other day pictures of crystals of polymorphs where you have needles and you have diamonds and you have blocks and you can see visually the differences between polymorphs. I'd like to be able to chemically and easily tell you what the um, the molecular recognition differences are among those polymorphs. And the only way we can do it now is to draw pictures of the structures, pick the right view, and point. And that's not very useful, if you, especially if you have 70,000 structures. We want to compare hydrogen bond patterns between chemically different kinds of molecules. This is something that's been almost impossible to do. We can take entirely different chemical systems, heterocycles, with nitrogen in them compared to organometallics or whatever, but they might have the same motifs. And they might therefore have some similar solid state properties. So this is where we forget what kind of atoms we have and we look only at the topological pattern. We'd like to be able to develop structure property relations based on the structures of these 
hydrogen bonded sets, or if you are interested in a different kind of intermolecular interaction, you could have charge transfer sets or or sulfur-sulfur bonded sets or whatever was of interest to you. We want to define which intermolecular bonds are made and broken during a solid state phase transformation. As a, a reaction takes place or phase transformation in the solid state, we can write down the motifs and the graph sets of the starting material and the motifs of the product, and we can see that four of them are retained and one changes. And so that's a way to define a solid state reaction. We'd like to be able to design new solid state materials, and the approach would be if we have a material that has fantastic properties and we want to make five more with fantastic properties, we don't just functionalize the molecule. What we do is to ask what kinds of molecules would give us those motifs, because then we're likely to get similar properties. And finally, we might be learning something about structures of, of sets of molecules in solution, even though that's a very hard thing to measure, because those sets of molecules might be what's nucleating crystal growth. And then we amplify the number of them as the crystal grows, and then we can study those structures. And so we've done a little work on trying to correlate graph sets with solution chemistry. It's a tricky business, but the idea is there. So now I'm going to look at a particular example that Joel Bernstein has worked out. Aminodiacetic acid is a fairly simple molecule. And the way we've represented it before is to show the picture of the molecule, and it, it's a zwitter ion in the solid state. There are three polymorphs, alpha, beta, and gamma. They have three different space groups. So we know this. We still don't know anything about how mo one molecule relates to another. So we go and we look at the unit cell constants for the three different polymorphs. We still don't know anything about the chemistry, nothing at all about the chemistry of the system. Then we make tables of hydrogen bond lengths and angles and symmetry relations. You see this in all crystal structure descriptions. We still, as a chemist, know nothing about the chemical molecular recognition properties of this molecule and how it differs from one to the other. Then we do even worse. We do this, and we show the unit cells, and we show the ORTEPs, and we say, there are the three polymorphs, and that's how they're different. And this is one reason so many dear, sweet, Synthetic organic chemists don't like getting into solid state chemistry. I don't like this either. This is not fun. There's a lot of important chemical information in there, but boy, you sure don't know what to do with it. And I'm not making fun of Joel here, by the way. He's the one who pulled these examples out as a way to show why we need to do graph sets. Although, I suppose I could tell a little story. Joel may not appreciate this. He was a, Joel Bernstein was a, visiting our lab as a, on his sabbatical. And I was sitting in my office one day looking through Octocrystallographica, and I had opened it to a page that had some ORTEPs on it. And I was just furious because I couldn't make heads or tails. I thought this was the most awful picture. And I, he just walked in at that time and I said to him, I said, Joel, this kind of stuff shouldn't be allowed to be published, especially in Octocrist. And he looked at it and he said, that's my paper. <laughs> he still stayed for the remainder of his sabbatical. <sighs> so, so then what we did is go to polymorph 1, 2, and 3 and pick out the motifs. And I've drawn the different motifs here. You can do it like I did with PNA, where I put colored lines through them. You can pick them out and draw what the different motifs are. And then we summarize the motifs in higher order networks for the three polymorphs. And look what we end up with. I can now even take this away. These three lines tell us the difference between the polymorphs. These polymorphs one and two have the same motifs. They're identical. Polymorph three has one motif that is slightly different, although it's sort of a subset of that. So three is distinctly different from those two. And we can now characterize three without doing anything more with it. That's how it differs from the others. And then you can go and look at the actual motifs, the chemistry of them, to see what 
that chemical difference is. One and two still aren't distinguished yet at the motif level. But if we go up to the combinations of two different kinds of hydrogen bonds, we find that one has a bigger ring than two does. And so the difference between one and two is the difference between this and this. And when those molecules crystallize, under one set of conditions they do this, and under another set of conditions they do this. And now we know about how the molecular recognition properties of those two differ. Also, do you notice this pattern? It's the one I told you a few minutes ago you find so frequently. And actually, we had drawn this picture. We had all this going. But until we signed that graph set, it didn't even occur to us it was the same pattern as the one that, that uh, benzanilate had, or benzamide, benzamide has. All right, now I'm going to show you real life. This is L-histidine. And it's a view of its crystal structure. John McDonald was working on the iris, and he got these pictures out. And this is what you get when you start looking at crystal structures. This is the monoclinic form. There are two polymorphs. And this is the orthorhombic form. What's the difference? Well, I'd even perhaps have trouble telling that the pictures were different at first. So we really need a way to deconvolute these patterns and get specifically at what the similarities or differences are. And it may tell us something about how crystals of those compounds grow. So John has done this. How long did it take you, John? Three days solid at the computer. That's why we need, and he's doing this by hand. It's not programmed. He's doing it by hand. So he has L-histidine. And the first order network, that is the motifs that he finds, are the same in both polymorphs. And he's drawn out what these motifs are. There's S6 is the intramolecular pattern. Here's a C8. And they're two different C5s. And both polymorphs have exactly those sets in them. You can't tell them apart at that level. So it's almost like these aggregates are floating around in solution, waiting to crystallize. And whether you get one or the other polymorph, Something else has to happen to differentiate the polymorphs. And so this is what he had to do. He took the monoclinic form and the orthorhombic form and started finding all the motifs that involved different kinds of hydrogen bonds. And he went through all, found all these different chains, and they were identical in both forms. So going through all that, they're still, not, they're still identical. But these are polymorphs. At some point, there has to be a difference. Then he started looking at the rings. And he finally found, at ring size 23, he found a ring with seven donors and six acceptors, 23 atoms in it, and it was not present in the other polymorph. And so that's the first stage at which there's a difference. So these molecules are floating around in solution. And boy, when they crystallize, it's going to be a very tiny difference that determines which of the two you get. And now as you go on, there are a lot of differences down here in the rings. And he could have gone on forever. He stopped, would you stop at 28 membered rings? Well, you could go to 500 if you want. But that's, that, this is why we need to computerize it, so that you can systematically find all these patterns and quickly check where are the differences. And at what point do you have, should, should you stop because you found what's important to you? And I'd just like to show you that having found some of these rings, you can then go back and plot the picture in such a way that you can see the ring. That's sensible. There's a ring. But it wasn't at all obvious when you started with the crystal structure that there were rings in there at all. And now this gives us a way to go back and say, there's that ring. I'm going to find it, and I can plot it. Designing new materials is one of the research goals of a lot of our work. And how do graph sets have anything to do with that? Well, one thing we've done is to look for distributions of graph sets among different kinds of functional groups. So let's take 1,000 carboxylic acids out of the Cambridge database and ask, is there a common graph set that occurs over and over and over again? And if so, this is a molecular recognition property of that functional group, irrespective of what R is. 
98% of the carboxylic acids in the literature have that dimer pattern. And that's not surprising. We, know, we all know that carboxylic acids dimerize. But that's an easy pattern to detect spectroscopically. It's an easy one to visualize in your mind. What about other patterns that might be just as common but have never been identified because we simply didn't have a way to think about it? If you look at nitroanilins, 75% of them have that motif. And we're probably talking about 50 structures there. If we look at phenols, 75% of the phenols have a C2 pattern. That's OH, 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 OH. And so that's not surprising. But, but now we can talk about what it is that phenols like to do when they find another phenol. That's how they interact with it. Now, a really powerful concept is having learned this. Let's design isographic sets. If we know what phenols do, there's one acceptor, one donor. Let's look at functional groups that have one acceptor and one donor on them. And so we could make molecules that are chemically substituted with very different kinds of functional groups, but that retain the number of donors and acceptors. And so you should be able to retain the motif. And the same thing, a nitro is very much like a carboxylate. They're chemically very different. But as far as the motifs they form, they're going to form very similar motifs. So you're going to be able to retain some of the solid state properties by substituting nitro for carboxylate. And even uh, a imid type with two oxygens here might, might be isographic with these functions. Although if you're thinking logically as a synthetic chemist, you wouldn't have thought these would give you similar properties. So then we come up with what we call isographic sets where we make these substitutions and then we look in the literature if the crystal structures are done and see if the motifs are preserved. And here's a set where they are. So there's something similar about the solid state properties of these compounds even though chemically they're quite different functionality. We've been interested in designing co-crystals and graph sets have been helpful in that regard. We have found out what the common graph sets of nitroanilins are, and I sort of show you this common motif and the chain pattern. And so we say, let's retain the connectivity patterns at the end of the molecule, but play with the center. And one thing we can do with the center is to make co-crystals. And on the outside of this pair of different molecules, we'll keep the nitro and keep the amine. And so when we make this co-crystal, when we make the acid dimer here, these groups hanging out on the ends, we know how they're going to organize that dimer. We're going to or they're going to organize that dimer in the solid state the same way they organize that molecule in the solid state. So we can predict the motifs. Then we start playing with what functional groups here will compete with those and allow us to do that. And we've made many, many co-crystals based on this idea, where the hydrogen bonds here are stronger than the hydrogen bonds out here, so they form first and then they leave these groups hanging over on the outside, and then they all link up together, and we know exactly the uh, organization pattern that we're going to get. Okay, now I've done something sort of tricky here. I've talked to you for 45 minutes or an hour here about hydrogen bonds and connectivity patterns and never told you what a hydrogen bond was. And I like to not do that. And one of the reasons is that focusing on a hydrogen bond and talking about how close that hydrogen is to that acceptor, what these angles are, what is the covalent ionic character of that bond, and all of that kind of thing, those are very important chemical questions. But what it does is make you focus on those three atoms and not look at the consequences of the hydrogen bond connectivity. The topology of what happens when a hydrogen bond form, forms is lost by taking that perspective. So what I suggest is you take a series of crystal structures that contain that functional group and that functional group. And look at the motifs that result. Forget about bond lengths, but look at how the molecules are arranged. And if all the molecules in that set of 100 have motifs that are the same, then I say they all have hydrogen bonds in them. Or I say, at least, they all have the same organizational properties, whether you call it a hydrogen bond or not. But if I artificially say this hydrogen bond has to be within these distance limits, and then go look through those structures, I'm going to lose the information 
that in one case where that bond was a little bit longer than our cutoff distance, the organization of the molecules was still exactly the same as for the other 99 structures. So I think you lose chemical information by using hydrogen bond cutoff lengths and, and angle cutoff lengths when you're comparing structures. We're looking for consistently giving rise to the same graph sets. Then we say that they have similar stabilizing interactions. And it's fine with me if you don't call them all hydrogen bonds, but they're all doing something similar, and that's what's important. And I'll just show you for the nitroanilins, what we did was to, to plot the nitro group from all the different nitroaniline structures and then put little dots for where the hydrogen atoms occurred of the NH group that's near that nitro group. And so for this whole set, if I draw a line here, this curve is the van der Waals contact distance. The dots sort of sp spread across that van der Waals contact distance. And if you use the van der Waals criterion as your cutoff length for hydrogen bonds, when you're looking through the nitroaniline set, you would say that all of these are hydrogen bonded, but none of those are. And the crystal structures actually say that. The authors say that in their papers. And what I said is forget about the bond lengths. Take all of them and see if their motifs are the same. Every one of these has the same motif. But the, some of the bond lengths are very long. And, and I would have trouble calling them a hydrogen bond. But the molecules have organized themselves the same way anyway. So we don't want to lose that information. That's the molecular recognition information. Okay, we're almost done here. So I have conclusions. What I think we need is a way to characterize and compare patterns of hydrogen bonds or patterns of molecules that are held together by an identifiable, measurable, useful, and interesting intermolecular interaction. I think that the most useful way to look at this is as a topological problem. Taking that perspective, there are several methods that might, might then work. The details might be different. Graph sets, I think, is an important concept and probably the most useful way to look at these problems. Um, they might even be chemically significant. I think in some cases they have been. The way in which you apply the graph sets, I think, is up for grabs. And we've defined one way to do it. There might be other better ways. And we're open to that. But there's no question that we need to automate these assignments. And the present method might work, but we already have seen some problems. We have some arbitrary assumptions we'd like to get rid of. And as we work on automating the assignments, I think that some of these problems will shake out. And we might end up with something that looks a little different than what I described to you. But the overall concept uh, is there. And I'd like to acknowledge the people who were very closely involved in this work. Professor Bernstein from um, University of Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion University in Beersheba. Uh, spent a year in our lab. It took about a half a year to convince him he ought to look at graph sets, but he really got hooked. And so he's been very involved in a lot of creative work with graph sets in the last couple of years. John McDonald has been very closely involved right from the beginning with graph sets, even going through a phase now and then when he didn't think they were very useful. Right now, I think he's in a phase where they're more useful. And other students in the lab who've contributed significantly to our ways of thinking about them. And sometimes their contributions were being, were that they just didn't believe these were interesting. And so they kept pushing us and pushing us and making us um, justify why we're doing things. And overall, out of that perspective, we've, we've come up with the ideas we have now. Susan Reitzel's worked on image co-crystals. And she has assigned graph sets to, I don't know, 80 or more co-crystals. A really daunting task, but it's a very, very interesting comparisons there. Gail Voida, who's now at, at Grinnell as a professor, was very useful in just talking about, or was very helpful in talking about the concepts, although she didn't use graph sets in her own work. Andrea Cicero did a very nice study on phenols and alcohols. She's now working at General Mills. Dan Adsman, who's here today, has been very helpful with the concept idea. He's also gone through several phases of thinking we really don't need this stuff. And he's particularly applied graph sets to amino pyrimidines. And Kin Chan Wong has been working consistently on the nitroaniline study and has been very helpful in thinking about graph sets as they apply there. And thank you for your attention.
would anyone like to ask questions? When you're looking at those, when you're looking at different polymorphs and trying to, trying to go to higher and higher networks, right? Would it be surprising if there wasn't, um, if if they were identical all the way through? That, right? It's not really I'm trying to think, to is it possible that they could be identical? I think the graph sets could be identical because if you, you could have four or five different chains of degree five, but the chains are chemically different, and we are not, we are not retaining that information. So we could have the same graph sets, but you could have different chains. So. I think it's not necessary that you see differences, but our approach usually has been to pick out the graph sets, the motifs, and look at what point there is a difference. It might be useful at some point to retain that chemical information, but every time you want to put more molecular information into the graph set, it gets more complicated. What's the difference in melting point between the two? question is the difference in melting point between what? Between polymorphs? Those, those a two particular those, two? Yeah. The histidines, John. Do you know about the melting point difference of the two histidines? Um, no. no. They're, they're probably very high melting because they're ionic. They, they tend to ionize. Oh, right. Catch that. Yeah. So John said he he doesn't know the melting points, but they're probably very high. Uh, Paul's point about melting point differences ought to be small because the graph sets are so similar. That's exactly why we're using graph sets is to say what chemical and physical properties will correlate with them. And when you have si similar graph sets, are there things you can say about similar properties between polymorphs? And we're really just beginning to do that. We have, there are only a couple of examples of polymorphs where we've done the complete graph set analysis and are just beginning to think about the chemical and physical differences between them and whether they relate to the graph sets or not. But something like melting point, hardness, fracture planes, color, are things that really might be related, morphology, that kind of thing. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you for coming. You are real troopers. <laughs>